Good evening. My name is Jonathan Stalling, and I'm the Harold J. and Ruth Newman Chair of U.S.-China Issues here at the University of Oklahoma. And I'd like to take a moment to welcome you all to the 2021 Newman Prize for Chinese Literature in celebration of this year's winner, Yan Liangke. I'd also like to draw your attention to the interpretation feature where you can choose to listen to this evening's award ceremony in English or Chinese. The Newman Prize for Chinese Literature is awarded biannually in recognition of outstanding achievement in prose or poetry that best captures the human condition and is conferred solely on the basis of literary merit. Every two years, an international jury of Chinese literature scholars from around the world decide the winner through a transparent process of positive elimination. And the winning author or poet receives $10,000 cash prize and a plaque. And the prize may serve as a crowning of a lifetime achievement or to direct attention to a developing body of work. The Newman Prize for Chinese Literature is part of the Institute for US-China Issues and its mission is to advance mutual trust in US-China relations. The Newman Prize honors Harold J. and Ruth Newman, whose generous endowment for a chair at the University of Oklahoma enabled the creation of the Institute and the Newman Prizes. While I wish all of you were here in person to celebrate Chinese literature together, I am so glad that we're able to share this moment virtually, just as an in-person celebration happened last week on the campus of Renmin University. And we will all have an opportunity to share that celebration together in a few minutes. Now I'd like to invite our Dean, of OU's College of International Studies, Scott Fritzen, to say a few words of greeting from our college. Greetings from the University of Oklahoma. My name is Scott Fritzen. I'm the Dean of the David L. Boren College of International Studies and Associate Provost for Global Engagement. And I'm delighted to share this moment of celebration with you this evening. I would like to take a moment to thank our guests from Renmin University, Dean Chen Zhenlan Yuanzhang, Secretary Yan Mei Shuji, and Yang Qingxiang Yuanzhang, and of course, the guest of honor, the 2021 Newman Prize winner, Yang Lingke Jiaoshou. It means so much to us that the Newman Prize Award Ceremony could take place in person in China this year. Later on this evening, we will all get a chance to witness the event held at Renmin University together. So thank you, Renmin University friends and colleagues. And of course, I'm pleased to welcome Harold and Ruth Newman and their children, whose generous support has made the Newman Prize possible. And finally, I am pleased to welcome all of the scholars, teachers, students, and fans of world literature to this year's Newman Prize celebration. While I look forward to welcoming you here in person in future years to share food, drink, and conversation, I am genuinely grateful to be with you virtually as we pay tribute to an amazing author in this virtual space together. Please let me introduce a little about our college as well. The David L. Boren College of International Studies was founded with the goal of producing high impact research on topics ranging from area studies to international relations and to broaden international exchange and research partnerships generally. And in so doing become a beacon for cross-cultural understanding in the US. China has always been one of the core foci of our college. And in this regard, the Institute for US-China Issues leads the way with its Newman Prizes for Chinese Literature and English Zhuizhu, Chinese Literature Today magazine and book series, uh, the Chinese Literature Translation Archive, the US-China Poetry Dialogues, and research programs which partner with OU's Chinese language program faculty, staff, and students, all leading the way in advocating for a deeper appreciation of living Chinese culture on the global, global stage. 
So it is a tremendous honor and a great pleasure that we celebrate the momentous occasion of Yen Ling Ke's accomplishments. And I hope that our great institutions can continue to work together in the future as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean Fritzen. Now every two years we come together to celebrate the work of a leading voice of Chinese literature and poetry. But we also use this occasion to celebrate young English poets who have embarked on a journey to learn how to compose classical Chinese poetry or jueju, gulu shi, gu ti shi, jian ti shi, in English. While translation is the lifeblood of, of Chinese literature abroad today, historically classical Chinese literary culture moved across languages and borders by way of local poets adapting their dialects and languages to follow all of the complex rules and regulations of classical Chinese poetry. Classical Chinese poetry was an important skill for anyone hoping to advance in East Asia as it demonstrated one's deep understanding of the cosmos and the unique challenges humans face as we attempt to balance and harmonize ourselves and our relations. It is in the spirit of this ancient tradition that the Newman Prize for English Jeju was created. And I'm excited to share a bit more about this year's winners and the poems that they have written. Three students from Oklahoma and one British student have won the 2021 Newman Prize for English Jeju. The Oklahoma winners include homeschooled middle school student, Tobin Bossy, OU student, Jacob Dayan, Mustang high school student, Dylan Che Chaisiri, and this year's UK winner, Sophia Saron from St. Paul's Girls School in London. Each winner will receive $500 check and a commemorative certificate. Honorable mentions include Jenny Long of Norman High, Wiley Ziegler of Whittier Middle School, and Allison Ramsey of OU. And an honorable mention for teacher submissions goes to Jen Lingshan from the UK. Beginning in 2013, the Newman Prize for English Jeju has been awarded to the best classical Chinese poem written in English. The catch is that they must follow all the rules of classical Chinese poetry. The Jeju is a traditional quatrain or a poem of four lines with either five or seven characters or monosyllabic words that typically follow a strict list of composition rules. The winner in Oklahoma's high school category, um, Dylan from Mustang, Oklahoma, a student of Karen Bolin, won with an amazing Gu Ti Shi or old style Jeju. Scarce clouds, ask sky, warm swift wind, calm stream, bright blue, oak birch blend, faint voice, Still dark, one last cast. Sunfall, moonrise, sweet day end. Dylan's poem captures an eternal moment familiar to many in Oklahoma, the last cast of a fishing line at dusk before calling it a night. The old style Dreju rules require a poet to write the first two lines to introduce and deepen a description of the natural world. He has that wonderful phrase, oak birch blend. While the third line introduces a human element and the fourth line reveals how that external scene resonates with one's internal feelings. And for master poets like Dylan, we also receive an insight, in this case, that sweet days like all things exist in cycles. The remaining winners of this year's Newman Prize for English Jeju follow the new style or regulated verse rules, the Jin Ti Shi or Ge Lu Shi tradition. These poems must follow all of the old style rules as well as a set of additional ones that require one to create parallel meaning between word groups in couplets. So that if we see cool stream in one line, directly below it we'll see cold breeze. The parallel in the sense that they both are flowing and refreshing. Typically, this effect is created by keeping word units in parallel parts of speech, adjective noun, adjective noun, for instance. But a poet may create an antithetical parallel, like warm sand, perhaps, to create a sense of variation and contrast. Yet in addition to following this rule, poets must also follow intricate vowel patterns that oscillate between what classical Chinese poets called ping and zi vowels. 
Now I have to take a minute to explain a few things about classical Chinese and English so that we can all come to better appreciate the incredible work these young and sometimes not so young poets have accomplished. In Middle Chinese, spoken in the Tang Dynasty, many Chinese words ended in an unvoiced consonant. That means the, the, the larynx doesn't vibrate. So P, T, and K, these words were called zi because these word endings shorten the duration of the vowel when compared to ping words, which end in voiced consonants like N, M, or NG, or no consonant at all. Well, it turns out modern English monosyllables follow the same pronunciation rules as classical Chinese. But our zi words can end in a variety of other unvoiced consonants like S, CH, the CH, or F, or the unvoiced TH, like with. While all other words in English are ping. So an example would be the ping word sky, so the long I sound becomes a zi word if we add a P to it, Skype, shortens the sound of the vowel. The ping word log versus the zi word lock and so on. Once a Chinese or English poet can discern the difference between ping and zi categories, one can bring monosyllabic English words into perfect balance by alternating them between ping and zi sounds, both horizontally in the lines, as well as vertically between them. For more information about the English Jeju form, the new, uh, the new style in particular, you can visit the website. All right, let's listen to these new style poems uh, with the UK winner, Sophia Cerrone. St. Paul's Girls' School, London. Her poem is a the start, new style Jeju. Sophia Sereni, age 15, from St. Paul's Girls' School in London. Reba. Cold mist. Fresh bud. Small chick. Sing. Thin hay. Sweet scent. Wind chimes spring, clear stream, lush grass, young child ship, new birth, bright dawn, once more, spring. Sophia's poem follows this ancient Z start vowel pattern. We can see that the first line's word units are parallel in meaning with the second line as pairs like words like cold mist and thin haze, right? Or fresh buds and sweet scents, or even small chicks sing with wind chimes ring, all have that unmistakable sympathetic resonance. The meanings may be perfectly parallel, but their vowels are perfectly antithetical. They are opposite. There's a unit ending in a zo sound, followed by one ending in a ping sound, below and following in the line. In this way, Sophia's poem reveals the possibility to bring language itself into harmony and balance, the yin and yang of both the meaning and the sound of words. Meanwhile, the poem's message develops from nature to human emotion and the message of new beginnings. Our Oklahoma Middle School winner, Tobin Bossy, Norman, has his own to start new style Jeju. My name is Tobin Bossy. I am from Norman, Oklahoma, and my poem is a to start new style Jeju. First light, soft mist, warm air, small rope flows, light fog, swift gust, quick stream goes, rough hail, bare dirt, cold hard night, fresh hope, brave dawn, young grass grows. So Tobin's poem begins with the two, two word unit, soft mist which is parallel in meaning with the two word unit beneath it, light fog, yet their vowels are opposite with the first two ending in the, um, and the one beneath it, ping. And yet, as we look at the third line, which and we see rough hail, we see an opposite meaning, an antithetical one to the words just above it, but their sounds are now perfectly parallel with the group above. As we read the rest of Tobin's poem, we can see that every other word unit, they're all equally well balanced with one another, following that prescribed pattern of meanings and vowel sounds, which result in a poem that not only announces the end of hard times and heralds rebirth, but is done so by bringing language itself into harmony and balance with nature. Finally, Oklahoma's adult category winner, Jacob Dayan, 
read his Pink Star New Style Treasure. 你们好，我叫丁立伟。Hello, everyone. My name is Jacob Dayan, and I'm currently a junior here at the University of Oklahoma. I am from Westfield, New Jersey, and I am an Asian Studies major at the university. I wrote this poem based upon a memory I had during a camping trip with my parents and my younger sister in Mountain Park, Oklahoma. My poem is a King Start New Style Juju, and the title of it is called "The Last Day of Summer." Here it goes: Clear sky, fresh grass, cool breeze slows, bright dusk, earth trail, calm creek flows, blurred thoughts, dead and torn heart. Six. Fast air, new trek, still bird crows. Thank you for listening. Jacob's poem follows that ping start pattern, with clear sky being ping unit followed by the zhe unit fresh grass. While the next line is a perfect opposite, with blurred thoughts ending in the zhe vowel, earth trail ending in a ping vowel, and so on. Yet Jacob has also created a wonderful sense of parallelism in the meaning of these lines, where clear sky is parallel with bright dusk, and also creates an antithetical resonance with that third line's blurred thoughts. Finally, his overall poem follows the underlying requirements of any treasure of this style to offer a poem that reveals the interconnected nature of human feeling in the natural world, ending in a single reimagined natural image. Still, bird crows. For further reflection on this year's honorable mention poems, please visit the English、uh, the, the、uh, English Treasure Prize website. And again, congratulations to this year's winners. Congratulations again to this year's Treasure Competition winners. As we move more close to this evening's main event, I'm genuinely excited to invite Harold Newman to give a few remarks. Harold and Ruth's contributions to bringing Chinese and American cultures and people closer together go back decades. As a former president of Asia Society, among other organizations, and for those who have been here in person for earlier prizes, you already know what a great speaker Harold is. And I wish you were all here to meet him in person. This evening, however, we will hear his words from his amazing daughter Joellen, who is joining us from Florida. Harold Newman's daughter, and I'm here to read the speech that my father has written for the recipient this year. He feels, in his young age of 90, that I would be better in the delivery of his words than himself. So this is his speech. I would like to congratulate the recipient on the Newman Prize. I have not had the pleasure of reading Dream of Ding Village. Or meeting Yan Lanke, author of the year selection for the Newman Prize, as I have met previously all of the other selected authors at the time of the awards. I have nothing to do in either selecting the authors or the work to be honored. That privilege is provided to our international panel of Chinese experts. This format has been followed since the inception of the prize. It has also included the recipient of the prize being brought to Norman, Oklahoma, to receive the medal and cash award. In the past, my wife Ruth and I have always had the great honor to spend time with the author. Unfortunately, because of COVID-19 and the circumstances, we don't have the opportunity to spend the weekend in each other's company, conversing, laughing, and getting to know one another much better. I have included here some quotes from the reviews that I found to be quite impressive and impactful. A must-read for anyone interested in present-day China. Communist ideals battle against capitalistic impulses and human nature in this grand, layered novel. Yan's unflinching, unflinching irreverence makes this Shutter Friday's tragedy essential reading. Written after three years of clandestine research on a real-life blood-selling scandal, his lyricism of despair, full of frenzied life, 
It's this novel, it's atrocious grace. After these reviews, I truly look forward to reading this book. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harold and Joellen. So Yelian Ko was nominated for the prize three times in prior years, more than any other author in the Newman Prize history, and this year again by Eric Abramson of Paper Republic. But this year was also a very competitive year with Wu He, nominated by Andrea Bachner of Cornell University, Su Tong, nominated by Yunta Huang of UC Santa Barbara, Xu Xiaobin, nominated by Chen Xiaoming of Beijing University, and Long Yingtai, nominated by Eileen Chao of Duke University. And I'm happy to invite this year's winner, the win winning juror, um, Eric Abramson, to introduce Yan Lianko better to all of us now. So please welcome Eric. Thank you very much, Jonathan, uh, to the University of Oklahoma and to everyone present today. It was my great pleasure to nominate Yan Lianko for the 2020 Newman Prize for Chinese Literature, and it is now my even greater pleasure to see him win. Uh, as Jonathan mentioned, I am merely the latest in a long line of jurors determined to honor Yen with his prize, and I am thrilled to be able to stand in their company and to know that they are standing in spirit here with me at this virtual podium. Uh, what follows is a revised version of my nomination statement. Yen's place within Chinese letters is uncontested. Uh, despite the controversial nature of his work, it seems every central second novel he's written has, can't be published within China, he stands shoulder to shoulder with the other great writers who emerged from the 1980s, Mo Yan, Wang Anyi, Jia Pinghua. More than any other writer of his stature, however, Yan Lianko remains vitally invested in the ethical responsibility of the author. Though it has been demonstrated to him again and again that his explorations of China's historical trauma are not welcome, he seems not to take the hint and persists in laying bare what he sees as the original sins of modern Chinese society. There's something almost naive in his insistent return to these subjects. In a sense, he has retained a measure of, quote, uh, authorial innocence. His stubbornness and the perpetual freshness of his sorrow over historical tragedy are worthy of our respect. But there is another earlier Yan, the master chronicler of the central plains of Hunan, tender observer of villagers who pit themselves against the elements, both natural and social. He views them with a love that has not clouded his vision. He sees all sides of them, has equal compassion for their suffering as he does for their depravity. They are the source of the fictional voice he hit upon in the early 1990s, which animates the stories of the years, the, month, the months, the days, and casts a relief of existential dread and awe over the land an evocation so powerful that it is able to serve as the foundational myth-making for an entire people. In his fiction, the land is the loom upon which all human endeavor and emotion is woven, and the colors he employs are dazzling. No dull tales of rural monotony here. It's no exaggeration to say that Yan's writing does for the Chinese heartland what John Steinbeck did for the American West or Thomas Hardy for South Southwest England. This is the style that blossomed into Yen's later more political novels, a literary development exemplified by Lenin's Kisses and Dream of Ding Village, as his eternal rural setting is invaded and upset by the forces of change. Yen may be China's best historian of the ways in which Chinese traditional society was unprepared for the abrupt, violent incursion of commercialism and capitalism. Denied the opportunity for gradual adaptation and evolution, lacking the institutions, values, and social mores necessary to protect against the destructive effects of this new way of life, traditional rural society reels under the onslaught. To use an analogy much on everyone's mind these days, society had not had time to strengthen its immune system uh, to build up the necessary antibodies. Yet under Yen's pen, these characters are no passive victims of these new forces, no silent sufferers. Instead, they are transformed by those forces into bizarre and monstrous new shapes and loosed to wreak havoc on their nation. As the 1990s led into the new century, the acceleration of economic process, progress paired with the absence of substantive political discourse continued to widen the split between the physical fabric of society, capitalism, consumerism, its changing economic systems, 
and the collective spiritual lives of the people. Even today, the China dream continues to hang like a mirage over the realities of life in this society. And in the gap between them lies all the surrealism, all the truth is stranger than fiction absurdity of Yen's mytho-realist style. Returning to Yen's earliest work reminds us of how literature can knit together the whole self of a people, body and soul. His later novels, meanwhile, remind us of the extent to which China's modernity, so much of its claims and its aspirations, remain only a thirsty farmer's fever dream. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eric, for that. And so finally, we will get to hear the presentation of this year's award. And, and we'll begin that with the introductory remarks of Dean Chen Jianlan from Renmin University, followed by the actual conferral of the prize and tonight's signature event, Yan Lianke's acceptance speech. Sunjing 严连科教授是享有国际盛誉的中国当代作家吹哭拉朽有时令人绝望的幽默概括起来有以下几点对严连科作品的研究目前已经招收五届学生文化游学和文化合唱就目前的培养情况来看
觉得一个比世界更大的村庄，呃，我只能以河南话来念它，大家谅解一下。女士们、先生们，尊敬的评委，在这特殊的新冠岁月里，我们以如此独特的方式进行纽曼文学奖的颁奖活动，这将成为我们大家日后独有的记忆，印刻在我们彼此的文学生涯里。是这样，在这样在我的文学生涯中，纽曼华语文学奖的意义将注定与我的生生存一样独有关键，因为这个奖中的“花语”两个字。标志着标志着一种语言，离开它的母系故乡后，有另外的最敏感来自共同这种语言微妙的人，在对这种语言和他所创造的文学的评估和认知。也正源于此，我以为这个来自俄克拉荷马的文学奖，每一届的颁奖都有华语写作的这个评估，在奥德赛中回归的意义，如同树必须根，文学必有骨架呀。语言与作家是由独属于他的母地故乡的，在全世界的文学创作中，我们看到了许多失去语言故乡的故乡创作，如上世纪生活的美国的马普科夫和如今还生活在法国的安德拉，以及今天生活在海外用法语和英语写作的高兴建、阿金、李易云等中国作家，他们每个人都写出了许多杰出的作品，但种种原因。当他们都不再放弃母语写作时，其所付出的努力和艰辛，也被我们可以想象的比拟。以及他们言，我的写作是异常幸运的，因为我不仅拥有语言的故乡，还拥有更为实在的母地的故乡。即便世界上有成千上万拥有这双重拥有的作家，虽然除却大家都必须有的语言之外，在论及彼此更与其接近的母地故乡时，世界上再也没有哪个国家的故乡可以我的故乡相提并论，因为这是一个大于世界的故乡和村庄。在那个村庄里，中国的过去和今天，所有发生和正在发生的一切，那个村庄都曾经发生和正在发生过：帝王、战争、灾难、贫穷、革命、饥饿。富有和人性源远流长的丰沛和复杂，在那个村庄都可以找到对应的发生和存在。从某种意义上说，那个村庄就等同于是中国的过去和今天，是过去和今天中国全部的历史、文化和现实的一个浓缩版，是中国的现实、历史和中国人在今天生动的存在和发生。中国人自古认为中国是世界的中心。永远是中国的中心，我说的那个母地和村庄，就是中原子中心，在那个村庄和村庄中间的土地上。所以，是中国最早的神话，在该中国相当一部分神话的发源地。又一点，是中国第一部诗歌总集《诗经》中许多诗歌其中的描述和原因。少年时，我随便随便翻过三，那山上就独有独白的描述和诗句。随便涉水过一条河，白居易就曾在那河边遇过仰望和长叹。那时候，因为我年少无知，不相信中国就是世界的中心，中原就是中国的中心，他想就是中原的中心。甚至看到半中原的路就在那个村落的不远处，中国的一个大师之一和称号就在我家乡的，就是我家乡的邻居之邻居。我觉得这些太不可思议了，其中可能可不真实。是一个村庄的虚构和传说，而今天，呃，我作为一个小说家，相信了这些，坚信了这些，因为我相信并坚信，真正伟大的文学是不需要虚构的，甚至连假设也不需要，因为在所有伟大的写作中，虚构是对生活中那部分看不见的真实所发现，别人看不见的你看见了，别人只能发现的你发现了，而当你以最个人的方式和。把这些发现呈现出来时，也也称此为虚构，而在美国，那却是百分之百的真实、现实和存在。我不在文学中虚构任何的假设的存在，我只在生活中尽力发现所有看不见的存在和真实。正是基于这一点，我发现，虽然我母地上那个村庄，它确实是中国的中原子中心，而中原又是中国的中心，中国又确实是世界的中心。一句话
那个村庄不仅是中国的中心，也是世界之中心。于是，我全部的生活和写作，也都是在有意无意的觉悟和发现这一点，不断的证明这一点，就是向读者、世人反复的用文学去证实这个村庄就是一个完整的中国。木字寄生，来自于通阿与通善，如此你就更深刻、更深层的了解、把握了中国和中国人。当然的，在我母地的那个村庄内，当你相信整个的中国就等同于那个村庄时，你却又同时会发现，那个村庄不仅是中国的，是华语世界的，也是今天整个人类世界的。它是人类世界的一部分，是这个世界最有活力的细胞和心脏。他的每一次脉冲和跳动，每一缕生活的纹理的来去和延展，都和这个世界的脉冲跳动相联系。慢一步或者早一步，但从来没有脱离开这个世界的脉冲跳动而独立存在过。在这个村庄里，天空、气候、环境、善爱、良知和恨恶，还有人们的思维和价值观、人的心性和德性、人们对宗教的认知、崇敬和默然。无不和人类世界上的任何地方、任何民族、任何人群相联系，他们既有高度的相似性与趋同性，又有令人惊异的隔膜和反动性。人类所有的奥秘和常识都编不在这个村落里，人类所有的物质和迷茫也都编不在这个村落的大街小巷上。人类人性中最、人类人性中的最幽暗和最良善，都鲜明地刻写在这个村落每个人的脸上、内心和行为中。一九七八年，我二十周岁参加参军离开这个村落后，在我二十六年的军旅生涯中，我的大伯在我每年探亲回家时，都会与我夫妻长谈推心置腹的问题：“连科，你说我们能解放台湾吗？你说中国和美国打仗能打过美国吗？”我大伯是二零六二零零六年写实的，这个一成不变的问题，他一连问了我二十八年之后，在这个村庄里。我也以为再也不会有人关心这些了，但在二年前，我又回到那个村庄时，有个给我叫哥的邻居，专门到我家门头坐了大半天。等到家人安没人安静时，他很郑重地轻声问我道：“哥，你说一个核弹头丢下去，能真的让一个国家消失吗？”在我朝他点头并做了解释后，他又非常不解地大声质问我：“既然核弹头这么厉害，那么中国为什么不喷？”我趁全世界都毫无防备时，朝所有的国家都丢一个几个核弹头，然后这个世界上就没有别的国家，只有我们中国了。我为我邻居的思考惊慌和愕然。那时候我待在他面前，哑口无言到长天长于地久。现在我在这里说这些，并不是为了讨论人和那个村庄的善恶，而是说世界上所有的虚妄。都在那个村人的内心里，人类世界上所有发生的事，即便在那个村庄没有发生过，也都在那个村庄识字不识字人的内心存在思虑中。当然不能说那个村庄一定等等于全世界，但至今，世界上很少有什么事情在那个村庄没有被思想，能和那个村庄无联系。高科技、网络虚拟世界和人类最传统、极致的宗教版的爱，在那个村庄的现实至今天。都如荒野中的金木花草一样繁荣与生动。我们，他们一边渴望有一天可以到上帝家里去做客，能和上帝攀谈结亲戚；又一边崇拜美国的科学狂人埃隆·马斯克，一边那里存在着深刻的嫉妒、目算和仇怨；又一边充满着上帝所渴望的人与人之间的爱。就超越各种人与人、文化与文化的关系言，在中国。再也没有中国人对日本人的情感更为复杂了。就在这百年来的恩怨与仇怨中，在那个村落里，有位母亲七十多年来，无论是在电视上还是村落人的谈论里，当大家看到，还谈到中国与日本人的仇杀历史时，那位母亲总会记起一九四五年，日本军队从中国败退时，一位穿着破烂、身上挂彩的日本士兵
拄着拐杖从口袋里摸出一颗小糖给了他。这位母亲说：“这是他人生第一次吃到的糖，知道世界上有一种叫糖的东西，竟然又这么甜。”所以，他终生记住了糖的味道和那张流血的日本士兵的脸，终生都渴望还给日本士兵一些什么去。二零一四年，我把春丽这位母亲的心愿带到了日本。从此有了更多的日本读者和老人，都渴望到这个村庄走一走，渴望见到这个村里的人。爱是可以化解一切的，人对一切有价值的东西的价值都不会超过爱。当我们在这个村庄看到有人渴望中国有核武毁掉人类时，也看到这个村庄最柔软博大的内心在爱着人类和世界，希望这个世界的角角落落都充满爱。我庆幸我出生在那个村庄里。庆幸我自己，几乎所有的至亲都还生活在那个村庄里。庆幸我不仅拥有那片村庄和土地，而且我还是那个村庄可分的一部分。我的本身就是那个村庄的本身。我今天所有的努力和写作，都不是为了给那个村庄的积累和增添，而是为了发现那个村庄本身就有的它与人类世界的共有共存的互生互动之关系。村庄不等同于是世界，村庄里的人却几乎等同于是人类所有的人。村庄不等同不等同于是人类，但那个村庄在许多地方、许多时候却比人类世界还要大，比我们所知的人类更为复杂和丰富。在这个中国中原最中心的村落里，那里的人相信共产主义就在明天的戈壁等候，可却也相信天堂在头顶，地狱在脚下。神灵就在自己的门口和内心，他们绝多绝多的人没有读过《身躯》是怎样一本书。然而，在那个村庄的风，方言风，方言风里却吹拂着《身躯》中的地狱、炼狱、天堂等类似的语言和传说。他们没有人读过《荷马史诗》和《奥维德的变形记》，和来自对，和对来自古希腊、古罗马的神话，却都能说出一二三。且有时说的比河马奥维德说的更为形象和生动。他们从来没有见过安娜卡拉尼娜是谁，但在那个村街上，却经常晃动着安娜的身影和说话声，以及每年每天都不消失的对艾玛诺欧的议论声。格里高尔和他的父母和妹妹，都还健康的活在那个村庄里。尤利西斯中的爱尔兰的大姐和小姐，都站在那个村庄每户人家的房前和屋后。那里的人，既深知柴米油盐对活着的重要性，又不断地谈论宇宙间的神秘和不可知。他们相信共产党、社会主义和共产主义的伟大和神圣，却也不断地向人向我探问道：“美国、欧洲和资本主义真的就那么美好吗？”实在说，那里确确实实就是一个村，人口只有数千人，但是那有那儿有确确实实是完完整整的中国和世界。且许多时候是大于中国和世界的浓缩和存在。实在说，我一生的写作，都立在，都立足在那个村庄里，也都立足在那个村庄，也只能立足在那个村庄里。然而，立足之目的却不单单是为了文学的创作和创造，而更多是为了对那个村庄的发现和证明。就我言，就我一生的写作言。我所幸，那个村庄说到底，它是它不是一个村，它是中国和世界之中心，是完整的中国和世界，是一个大于世界的村庄和世界。在这儿，我要郑重的谢谢那片土地和村庄，谢谢正在信任和敬重的纽曼文学奖的评委们，也郑重的谢谢今天所有参与颁奖的同仁朋友们。最后，希望大家严重。语言的漏，有一天能通过一道到那个村庄，到我家里去做客。谢谢大家。It is we who thank you, Professor Yan Liang Ke, for your extraordinary life's work and wonderful speech. And we really, genuinely hope to invite you here to the University of Oklahoma in the very near future. And we hope to host、uh, all of you next time as well. Everyone can read the speech. And the remarks by Eric and others in the next issue of our journal Chinese Literature Today. And I'd like to thank my colleague Liu Nian, Professor of Chinese,、uh, for her, all of her translation work this evening. So thank you so much, Liu Nian. It's been her voice that you've been listening to if you chose the Chinese option. Stephanie Sager for running the tech. 
Mara, uh, McAndrew for all the media support, Wu Keshuan and Xu Shiyan for your translation support, and to all the faculty and staff of OU, as well as Zuo Ding and others at Renmin University for all that they've done to hold the event in person and for our online event this evening. Thank you all so much for coming. And let's take a moment to give one more round of virtual applause to all of our winners. And of course, most especially to Yan Lian Ko. Thank you and farewell.